Welcome back, everybody. Today is a special day. We've worked really hard over the past couple weeks, and now I think we know everything we need to know to do our first inferential statistical test. And the way we do inferential statistical tests is via a four-step hypothesis testing procedure. So that's what we'll focus on today. We'll just ease into those four steps because those four steps actually include quite a bit of detail. So as we go through several examples, we'll learn some of those details, like the difference between one-tailed and two-tailed tests, the difference between type one and type two errors, and then we'll also learn about effect sizes and statistical power. All of that will come in time as we go through several examples. As we work through this four-step hypothesis testing procedure, we're going to put together everything that we've learned so far. And we've learned some pretty important things. We learned that area equals probability, we learned that differences that exist between groups could reflect differences between those populations, or it could simply reflect sampling error. We learned about distributions of sample means. We learned how to create them, and we also learned all about their properties based on central limit theorem. And then we used that information that we learned about distributions of sample means to find exactly where any particular sample mean is and then determine how common or how rare it actually is. For example, this particular sample mean is unlikely to occur just due to chance. Well, now we're going to put all of that information, all of those new skills to use, because we're essentially going to put our data on trial. Via this four-step hypothesis testing procedure, we will determine if we have enough evidence to conclude that we have statistically significant results. We call this process hypothesis testing because we will be hypothesizing about some unknown population parameter. Remember, mu, a population mean, is a population parameter. For example, let's assume we're doing some research on severely depressed people. And for that population of severely depressed people, we might know that the population mean depression score on some depression scale is equal to 26. So on average, they're scoring 26 on that scale, and that's a score that indicates severe depression. Well, we want to test a new treatment, and we want to see if that treatment is effective. But, of course, we can't test the entire population of depressed people. So ultimately, we're going to test this new treatment on a sample of depressed people. And then based on that sample data, we're going to try to learn about the population that they represent. And keep in mind, those treated people, they now represent the population of treated people. So in other words, we're going through these four steps because we're trying to learn about the population mean depression score after treatment. We don't know what that value is. We know that before treatment, this population scores on average 26 on that depression scale. But if we were to treat that entire population, what would be their new depression score? There are essentially three different possibilities. It's possible that their depression score wouldn't change at all, and that after treatment, their average depression score would still equal 26. That would show that our treatment has no effect. It doesn't work. It's ineffective. But of course, it's possible that the treatment works, and that after treatment, the average depression score is statistically significantly lower. And don't forget about this possibility too. You know, sometimes we think about things in the wrong way. It's possible that we'll do something with this new treatment to upset people even more. So it is possible that after treatment, the population mean depression score for those treated people will actually be worse. They'll actually be more depressed. So this is really exciting because we now have an opportunity to draw conclusions about our data. And we will draw those conclusions by working through these four steps. This graphic right here might help you better understand what I was just saying. We are hypothesizing about an unknown population mean. So this population mean we already know because this distribution right here represents the population of depressed people and their scores on a depression scale. Of course, just like in any other population, there's some variability. We see that the standard deviation equals four right here, but we focus on average scores. So among this entire population, the average score is 26 on the depression scale, and that represents severe depression. But this is the question. 
Let's say we took this entire population and we ran them through the new treatment. Now what would their mean be? We will try to learn about the value of that unknown population mean through our sample data. And we want to see, is there enough evidence to conclude that it's less than 26? Is there enough evidence to conclude that these people are now less depressed? Or does the evidence show that there's no change at all? And as I mentioned, there's also the possibility that after that population runs through that treatment, they're even more depressed. We did something to make them even worse. Those conclusions that we will draw about this population will be based on a sample of people who have gone through our new treatment. You might recall that's why we call this inferential statistics, because we're drawing inferences about the population that that sample represents. We will collect data from a sample of depressed people who go through our new treatment, and we will learn about the population they represent from that sample. At this point, I want to discuss these four steps, but I don't want to discuss them too long, and I don't want to discuss them in too much detail. Because honestly, in this format, as you're learning about this through a video, the best way to learn the four steps is to actually work through some examples going through those four steps. But we need to be reasonable. Before you can start working on those four steps, you need to at least be introduced to them. Let's start by briefly talking about step one. In step one, we are going to specify our hypotheses. And we will have two competing hypotheses, a null hypothesis, which we signify with an H sub zero. So H represents hypothesis. And null, N-U-L-L, -L, essentially means nothing. The null hypothesis is the hypothesis that states this treatment has no effect at all. So, for example, I was mentioning that before treatment, this population of severely depressed people had an average score of 26 on that depression scale. Well, the null hypothesis is stating the population mean, mu, the population mean depression score after treatment equals 26. If the population mean depression score after treatment equals 26, and the population mean depression score before treatment was equal to 26, what does that hypothesis say about the treatment? It says it doesn't work. And that's what the null hypothesis is all about. Remember, we will have two competing hypotheses, and one hypothesis will state that this treatment has no effect. I know that sounds strange, but it's really not as strange as you think. And if you think about this one analogy, it's going to help you out. As we work through these four steps, continually compare them to the same types of steps we go through, at least in terms of our reasoning, as a juror in a criminal trial. In a criminal trial, there are two hypotheses about the defendant. One is that the defendant is innocent, and the competing hypothesis is that the defendant is guilty. And remember what jurors are always told. At the beginning of the trial, you should presume that this suspect is innocent. And the reason why a juror should presume that the suspect is innocent is because at that point, you as a juror, you have no information about this person. You have no information about the crime. So you should just assume the status quo about this person. Well, it works the same way as we're analyzing this research data. At this point in the process, we have no information about this treatment. So we should just assume it doesn't work. Well, as I mentioned, we do have two competing hypotheses. The next hypothesis that we're going to list, we call the alternative hypothesis. And we symbolize that with an H for hypothesis sub 1. And in this case, the alternative hypothesis needs to say everything else about this treatment. If the null hypothesis stated that the treatment had no effect at all, the alternative hypothesis needs to state that that treatment does indeed have an effect. And you'll notice I'm being kind of vague about saying it has an effect because it could have a good effect and it could statistically significantly lower depression scores, but that new treatment, it could have a bad effect and it could statistically significantly increase depression scores. That's why when we're doing this type of test, we write our alternative hypothesis like this. We say the population mean depression score after treatment is unequal to 26. If we conclude that the population mean depression score for the treated people is something other than 26, we are concluding that this treatment has at least some type of an effect. And the first couple examples that we go through, they will be these two-tailed tests. We call these two-tailed tests 
because we're leaving open the possibility that the results could have an effect in either direction. That might seem a little strange to you as well, because if I'm a researcher and I think this new treatment is going to be effective, I must think that it works. But keep in mind, I'm a human being, and my mind doesn't always think about things correctly, and sometimes I'm wrong. So we should always do these two-tailed tests if, theoretically, the results could go either way. And, of course, in this situation, theoretically speaking, the results could go either way. Our new treatment could help these depressed people. Our new treatment could hurt these depressed people. I'd say easily 90 or 95% of the statistical analyses that are reported in journal articles are these two-tailed tests. We also call those non-directional tests. Because these two-tailed tests are so common, we're going to focus on them first. And then we'll talk about directional or one-tailed tests a little bit later. Remember, I said I didn't want to get into too much detail right now. I just want to introduce you to these four steps so that we can start using them. All right, at step one, we have these two competing hypotheses. And we mentioned that we are going to proceed along, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Well, how much evidence do we need to reject that null hypothesis? How much evidence do we need to no longer believe that it's true? And remember, everything that we're doing here has an analogy in the criminal justice system for when we put people on trial. You should proceed assuming that that suspect is innocent, but you need to ask yourself, how much evidence will it take before you reject that initial assumption that the person is innocent and you embrace the alternative assumption that the person is guilty? Well, that's pretty easy for us because in step two, we lay out exactly how much evidence we need to reject that null hypothesis and then conclude that we do have statistically significant results. You know what this is right here? It's a distribution of all possible sample means. You see, all of our old friends are coming back. And we will create a distribution of sample means based on the idea that that null hypothesis is true. In other words, we will create this distribution of sample means based on the idea that that new treatment has no effect. It does not work. If that treatment doesn't work, we would expect to find lots of sample means right around 26. Because remember, before these people went through treatment, their average depression score was 26. So the sample means that we find right around here that are close to 26 are the types of sample means we would expect to find quite often when the null hypothesis is true, when the treatment has no effect. And just due to sampling error, we're going to find some variability from one sample mean to the next. That's what the distribution of sample means is all about. But keep this in mind. Sample means down here, they are unlikely to be found when the null hypothesis is true. So if I find some really low sample means, those are very unlikely to be found if this treatment has no effect. Do you see how sample means that we would find in this area are inconsistent with the null hypothesis? And at some point, we will literally draw a line, and we will create what we call a rejection zone. And if we find a sample mean in this rejection zone, we will reject the null hypothesis, which states the treatment has no effect, and then we will conclude that we have enough evidence to say the treatment works. It statistically significantly lowers depression. Keep in mind, there is another awkward potential outcome it is possible that we'll find a sample mean that is in this rejection zone. And again, the sample means that occur in this area are very unlikely to occur just by chance. Sampling error is not a good explanation for those results. In this case, we would conclude that the new treatment statistically significantly worsens depression. Let's compare this again to a criminal case. You might be sitting for a trial in which the defendant is being charged with robbing a store. You will initially presume that that person is innocent. At that point, you will evaluate the information provided during the case. And let's just say that the prosecutor provides a tape that shows this person walking into a store with a gun and robbing the clerk. And you see the defendant's face plain as day. You need to ask yourself, what's the probability of finding this type of data just by chance? And do you see it's analogous to that data being down here? It's very unlikely to be found just by chance. If this person is innocent, it's very unlikely to find a videotape 
showing what appears to be them committing this crime. That would be enough evidence for you to reject that null hypothesis and then conclude that this person is guilty. Well, if we find a really low depression score, that's going to be enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis, which states this treatment doesn't work, and then conclude that this new treatment actually does statistically significantly lower depression. So the question remains, where do we draw these lines? If we're going to have this little small area, this little small rejection zone, where do we draw the line? That's determined by what we call the alpha level. That right there is a Greek letter alpha. And that alpha level determines the size of those rejection zones. Those rejection zones are also known as critical regions. So you might hear me refer to them as critical regions or rejection zones. And here's the good news. In most fields, they have already determined that these critical regions, these rejection zones, should mark off the most extreme 5% of the sample means. So when we create this distribution of all possible sample means, we're going to mark off the most extreme 5% in this little area and this little area combined. So if we are doing that two-tailed test that we talked about, where we could find statistically significant results in either direction, over here or over here, if we are using an alpha of 0.05, 5%, which is very common, we will have 2.5% of the sample means located in this critical region and 2.5% of the sample means located in this critical region. Those critical regions, those rejection zones, will show us how much evidence we need to reject the null hypothesis and conclude we have statistically significant results. Using our Z table, it's very easy to find exactly where those cutoff points are. So let's look it up real quickly. We need to find where there's 2.5% in the tail. Of course, the tail is the smaller portion. So I'm going to look at this column that says smaller portion, and I'm going to look for the closest thing to 2.5%. 2.5% would be 0 0.025. And I'm going to need to go pretty deep into the distribution. And look, there it is right there, 0 0.025. And the z-score that marks off that 2% is a z-score of 1.96. And remember, we need that on both sides of the distribution. So the critical regions will be marked off at positive and negative 1.96. And that's exactly what you see right here in this graphic. Keep in mind what that represents. This is a distribution of all possible sample means. What we're saying is we will reject the null hypothesis and conclude that this treatment statistically significantly lowers depression when we find a sample mean that is 1.96 standard errors below the mean or less. So we're talking about that sample mean being about two standard errors less than the original value of 26. That is what we call a statistically significant difference. I mentioned that in many fields, they use that value as the cutoff point. They use that alpha level of 5%. Not all fields agree. Many do. Psychology, sociology, social work, education. In so many fields, they use that alpha level of 5%. But keep this in mind. This distribution of sample means, it shows all possible sample means based on that null hypothesis being true. In other words, sometimes, just by chance, we will find sample means that are really low. Those are sample means that are found just due to sampling error. So in those situations, we will conclude that the new treatment works, it statistically significantly lowers depression, and we will be wrong. We will be wrong because we will have found that sample mean just due to chance. And that happens in the legal system as well. Sometimes there's so much incriminating evidence against a person that we convict them, and later on we find out we're wrong. Well, we don't like when that happens. We don't like when that happens in the criminal justice system, and we don't like when that happens in statistical analyses. So we try to keep these rejection zones, these critical regions, as small as possible. But we need to be reasonable. If there's going to be some type of an effect of this treatment, we need to have a chance to find it. When we conclude that we have statistically significant results and we're wrong, those are called type 1 errors. So when we convict somebody of a crime and we're wrong, those are called type 1 errors.
at least theoretically speaking, an alpha level of 5% caps the probability of making a type 1 error to 5% of the time. Some disciplines aren't happy with making those type 1 errors 5% of the time, and they decide to take those critical regions and push them out. In other words, they decide that they need even more evidence in order to find statistically significant results. As I said, I'm just trying to introduce you to each one of these steps. We'll talk about that detail a little bit later on. As we go through examples, we'll go through some examples with different levels of alpha. Let's talk about step three. Step three is pretty easy for us. It's all about collecting the data. Now, we won't typically be collecting the data. When we're analyzing examples in class, the data will already have been collected and summarized. So what we need to do is take that data, take that sample mean, and transform it into a z-score. And we already know how to do that. Once we transform that sample mean into a z-score, and we figure out where it's located on that distribution of sample means, we'll determine if it is or if it's not in one of those critical regions. If that sample mean falls inside of one of those critical regions, if that sample mean falls within that rejection zone, we will reject the null hypothesis and conclude that we have statistically significant effects. But if that sample mean does not fall in a critical region, if it does not fall in a rejection zone, we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. I know that seems like odd phrasing, but it's the phrasing we use. If we are going to fail to reject it, it means we're going to continue to embrace the null hypothesis. We're going to continue to assume this treatment had no effect. And again, a legal analogy works pretty well. If you don't find enough evidence to convict a defendant, we don't conclude that the defendant is innocent. We conclude that the defendant is not guilty. So that's an introduction to the four steps, my friends. In the next video, we're going to go through example one, and then we'll have another video where we go through example two, and then another video where we go through example three. We'll go through four complete examples, and along the way, we'll talk about each one of those steps in much more detail to make sure you understand the nitty gritty of this four-step hypothesis testing procedure. I'll see you in that next video. In the meantime, be safe.